G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I wanna begin by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to the elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Uh, as you will know, if you've joined us before, the Australia Institute does aim to do these webinars at least weekly, but sometimes like this week, we have two webinars, sometimes more than that. And you can find all the details for those and register at australiainstitute.org.au. You'll be able to find those in the events section. Just a few tips before we begin to help things run smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A box where you can ask questions of our panel. You should also be able to upvote questions from other people and make comments on their questions as well. A reminder to please keep things civil in the chat or we'll boot you out. We don't have to do it very often, but we will if we have to. And finally, a reminder, this discussion is being recorded. It'll go up on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel uh, within the next 24 hours after this. So hopefully many of you would have joined us in June for our discussion about electrifying everything with clean tech entrepreneurs, Danny Kennedy and Saul Griffith, where we presented an inspiring and optimistic vision, um, so unusual in climate change policy debate, uh, with a vision of a prosperous Australian economy powered by clean energy. And we just got such amazing and enthusiastic feedback about that, um, both during and after the event. So today I'm really pleased to say that we're one step closer to making that vision a reality with the launch of Rewiring Australia. Before I introduce you to our esteemed guests, I'm afraid I have to say that Minister Matt Keane was unable to join us this morning. As you might imagine, there's a fair bit happening in New South Wales politics um, and events in New South Wales has meant that he's got urgent commitments elsewhere today. Uh, for those of you who aren't glued to the news, like some of us junkies, Dominic Perrottet has been announced as the new Premier. Um, but before we uh, get sidetracked into all of those shenanigans, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Ben Oquist, the Executive Director of the Australia Institute, Saul Griffith, the founder of Rewiring Australia, which is a blueprint for an entire clean energy economy in Australia that will lower bills, create millions of jobs and meet climate goals. Um, you might have seen him on ABC News Breakfast this morning. And of course, the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio, uh, Victorian Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change. And of course, our very own Richie Mersey and Director of the Australia Institute's Climate and Energy Program. Ben, if I could hand over to you now to say a few words before we get started on the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Ebony. And thank you, Saul. And thank you, Minister D'Ambrosio. Also, thanks to the Climate and Energy team at the Australia Institute who've helped put this event together and help drive the report that Saul is releasing today, in particular, Program Director Richie Mersey and, and our energy and policy and regulatory lead, Dan Cass. A, an amazing effort to help get us here today. Um, Saul, your intervention is so needed. To act, we're told, on climate change is to sacrifice. Indeed, you know, two years after that really damaging report by Brian Fisher that warned of economic decline, lower wages, higher unemployment, cumulative GNP losses that was waved around all over the media by sections uh, of our political class. Um, we're still dealing with the consequences of, you know, really misleading and um, devastatingly bad report. Uh, but um, uh, your work, Saul, indeed, um, Minister D'Ambrosio's work shows the exact alternative of opportunity, of solutions and savings. Acting on climate change can bring economic prosperity uh, for the country and for households. So it's a great delight to be introducing what is an achievable and importantly equitable roadmap for dramatically cutting Australia's emissions using the proven technologies uh, available to every one of us right now. Electric cars, kitchen ranges, water heaters, um, heating systems. Um, by 2030, Australia's households could be saving $65 billion a year, uh, which is the equivalent to our export earnings from coal. Uh, and the good news is the appetite from voters is there. Our uh, big 2021 Climate of the Nation report polling is out uh, next week, and it indicates huge support for federal government to be doing more to increase EV to uptake in Australia. Um, it shows uh, Australians want to electrify household appliances with the right government incentives. Um, and of course, best place to present this roadmap um, 
for rapid decarbonisation is uh, the man behind rewiring Australia, Saul Griffith. Uh, I'd like to thank Saul for your great work for being here today. I hope you all caught 7.30 uh, last night, um, featuring the launch of Saul's report, uh, a great uh, insight into what's at stake. Um, but also uh, to Lily D'Ambrosio, the Victorian Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change. Uh, uh, Lily, your leadership is so needed, um, not just for Victoria, but uh, nationally. And we're delighted to be able to bring uh, your vision and ideas to a national audience uh, here today with Saul. Uh, as Ebony said, Matt Keane's not uh, with us for obvious reasons uh, today. Uh, and he was unable to join us, uh, but his ideas um, about uh, Saul and his uh, views about it are well known and reported in uh, the paper on the weekend. So dive into that if you can. The policies and active implementation of those policies we are seeing in New South Wales and Victoria to make the switch to an electric future is really encouraging um, in an era where we often hear how dispiriting um, uh, the, uh, the politics of climate change can be. Real leadership being shown in uh, New South Wales and Victoria shows what can be done. And it's a great um, meeting of, of minds, if you like, to have uh, Minister D'Ambrosio and Saul Griffith with, uh, with us today. Uh, last of all, um, uh, Ebony, thanks to you for hosting us today and thanks to all of our audience um, for your continued interest and support in the work we do and, the, and these webinars. You're the reason why uh, we're here today um, and uh, Saul and Lily's work, as important as it is, uh, can't be taken forward uh, without community support and engagement. Um, uh, and thank you to everybody who's uh, tuned in not just to today, but the series in general, um, allowing um, the community to be part of um, these important political and policy debates. Take it away, Saul. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ebony. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, everyone out there for dialing in today. Um, I'm going to go to sharing my screen. Hopefully, someone can tell me that it's working correctly. Yep, we can see there that. So my name's Saul Griffith, and we're launching not only a, a report on what house, Australian households have to save today, but a new organisation, Rewiring Australia, which is going to hopefully persist in advocating for very rapid action on climate change and trying to tell the positive narratives of what is possible. Um, so it's, it's the stories of what we have to win as opposed to the stories of what we have to lose. Um, I'm actually dialing in from San Francisco today, uh, back in America, to launch a book called Electrify, uh, which launches with MIT Press uh, next Tuesday, in fact. Um, so that explains my absence. Normally I live actually in a very traditional coal mining town in Austin Muir, just on the outskirts of Wollongong in New South Wales. Um, the work that we did today has its origins in, in uh, a curious hobby that I have, which is energy data, which I've been studying for about 20 years to understand what is behind what we know or what we think we know about energy. In 2018, that became a contract that I did with the Department of Energy. And the map that you see before you that looks like a bowl of spaghetti is in fact tracing all of the energy flow through the US economy in enormous detail right down to how much energy is used on school buses, how much energy is used in refrigerators and commercial buildings, et cetera. And it's this level of insight that enables you to really sort of think through uh, what a, a, a whole economy climate solution looks like. Um, that work has led to us starting another organization called Rewiring America, which has been actually working with the White House and with the Senate on writing the American uh, $3.5 trillion bill uh, on climate. And so I can also compare the Australian experience to that front row seat in the US. But to bring it to Australia, it was actually, it was that work in the US that led me to realize that Australia gets to go first in the good news stories. So let's get to the good news story for Australia. Just for a quick context, this is the Australian emissions. We obviously export a huge amount of fossil fuels. That's up top. That doesn't count on us. But our domestic economy is divided roughly into the energy we use at home in, in, within Australia and the energy we use in our industry uh, to create the exports that we export. So if we just look at that domestic economy, the energy that um, we use in our own economy, about 42% of that 
is of those emissions come from decisions we make in the household and another 30% in commercial buildings. And today we're talking about those 40% emissions that come from the household, which are something we can really eliminate uh, this decade. And rather than, you know, the reason we went to at length to separate out the domestic economy from the export economy, to be quite honest, the answers there for the export economy aren't quite there, um, but we are in paralysis of inaction waiting for a whole economy answer, whereas this lets us focus on the mind on what works right now while we develop the technologies for green steel over the next decade. So um, let's talk about this. So those 40% of emissions are decisions that we make around our kitchen tables. What fuel is in our cars? What heat is in our homes? Where does the electricity come from? And how are the fuels made? Uh, and it's consequential for the average Australian home. So the average household has around $80,000 year, uh, a year in expenditures and close to $4,800 of that is on energy. So we spend you know, $2,500 on petrol or diesel in the average house, about $620 on natural gas in the average house. We spend more on electricity than meat, about $1,700. And so you can, can see that it's consequential, these payments um, for the Australian household. What we did in the study, this is really the giant summary of the good news story. So $0 is just baselining it at what happened last year. So we're looking relative to where we were, what happens if you electrify everything in the household? So what does that really mean? There's about 1.7 cars in the average Australian household. So we go through the math of paying for and electrifying both of those. We electrify the water heating systems, we electrify the space heating systems, we electrify the cooking and kitchen systems, and then we provide enough solar on the roof and enough battery backup to make sure that that's 24 seven electricity for the whole year. Indeed, if you bought that bundle of goodies in 2022, the average Australian house would be paying about $5,000 more per year than they would in their current uh, energy expenditures. But you can see that we're on this very rapid curve down here. And that's because batteries, battery packs are about $1,200 a kilowatt hour today, but they're going to get to $200 a kilowatt hour by 2025. Similarly, Bloomberg New Energy Finance is showing that electric vehicles will be cheaper than the petrol vehicles in the showroom in 2025, 2026. So all of those cost curves are, are good news. And you can actually see 2024, 2025 will be the year where we start to save up, up to $1,000 a year per household. And by 2030, if we really hit the gas, the average household in Australia will be saving $5,500 compared to what they spend today for driving their vehicles and heating, cooling, and powering their homes. That actually translates to huge savings for the economy. Uh, you can see there's a little gray line there. So we assume that we're gonna slowly ramp up in the next five years to try and get a quarter of households done. That'll be an investment because the economics don't quite work yet. That'll be a few billion dollars a year of investments. But then once we get to about 2026, the economy starts to save huge amounts of money. And uh, by 2030, close to $40 billion a year across all of our households. So we really, you know, if, we, if Team Australia was thinking about climate change as an opportunity to invest, this is the best investment we could make. And that is summarized in the last picture I'll show you. Oh. In this slide here, for a sum of about $12 billion investment over the next five years, and then continuing to hit the throttle to try and electrify all homes and all vehicles by 2030, um, we are absolutely uh, raking in the savings uh, by the end of this decade. And in fact, saving, persisting at saving 40 plus billion dollars a year on from there. So that's the, the giant opportunity for Australia um, and I think is an opportunity that we should, we should take. What I would love to see is uh, I think we have the opportunity for leadership in Glasgow. This is, this is a point I'd really like to make. I have the privilege of working with both European governments, the American government, and I, in conversations with the Australian government. What we're seeing in climate globally is the more ambition any country shows, it gives more space and opportunity for other countries uh, to have ambition. Australia has the best version of this story in the world. That's because, well, actually I'll, I'll, I'll express it this way. When I'm talking to the American government, I say, 
if a country could exist that had Australia's solar policy, California's electric vehicle policy and South Korean heating, building heating policy, you'd have the perfect country that's solving climate change on schedule. So Australia's, the Australian solar miracle is, is a, one of the pillars and we need to do the same thing now for our building heating systems and for our electric vehicle systems. Um, and if we did that aggressively, we could actually believably go to Glasgow and say, world, I'm sorry, we haven't been great yet, but in the next decade, we're gonna electrify our domestic economy. That'll eliminate at least a third of our domestic emissions. And in the, 20, the decade that follows, we will electrify our industry and our exports, and we'll give you the green steel and the green aluminum and the green metals that will enable your economies to decarbonize by 2040. That would be in Australia, I think that we would all be proud of. And uh, I'll stop there and go to questions. You're just on mute, Ebony. Thank you. You'd think I, anyone would think I hadn't been doing this for 18 months. Um, Lily, uh, Minister D'Ambrosio, I'll come to you next. We've obviously seen an amazing uh, vision outlined there and a much more positive one than we normally uh, hear about when it comes to climate policy. I just wonder if we could get your response to that vision that Saul's outlined there. Well, thank you very much, and um, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, can I acknowledge uh, Saul and the fantastic splash this has made in the last few days uh, to, to culminate in this uh, terrific um, uh, event here this morning? And also, of course, uh, I need to, uh, and I want to, uh, pay my respects to uh, the Wurundjeri people. And they, they are the people, the owners of the lands on which I'm situated here in Victoria. My respects go to all elders past, present and emerging, uh, and any other uh, traditional owners who uh, have joined uh, with us here today. Uh, the rewiring uh, work, uh, as Saul has uh, labelled it, is, is a very exciting one, but it absolutely speaks volumes to uh, the opportunities that we've got in front of us to uh, decarbonise uh, our economy. Uh, and if you have a look at Victoria's experience over the last six years, we've had uh, incredible success in delivering uh, new renewable energy projects, for example, going from 10% of our generation at the end of 2014 to around 30% earlier this year. Uh, and we've also, of course, shown that you can reduce emissions with great ambition while growing our economy. So uh, if we have a think about that, uh, we're delivering 44% uh, of economic growth uh, while cutting our emissions by 25%. All of that since 2014. But it's also been a very democratic way of doing it, involving communities, having communities come with us. Uh, that's the social license that is so critical to a successful transition. Uh, the decarbonizing, the decarbonisation journey uh, has to be a democratic one, uh, one that is embraced uh, by communities and uh, be able to demonstrate and deliver on real benefits uh, for them uh, that they can feel and touch and enjoy at a household level or a business level, but of course, right across our community. We've shown that uh, with renewable uh, renewables, you can create uh, thousands of jobs. So our 50% renewable energy target by 2030, will see more than 25,000 jobs created. Uh, and we've also shown that uh, by uh, clean energy, clean power, you can, split, you can slash power costs. So in Victoria, we've seen bills declining. This is household bills declined by more than 10% over the last 12 months alone. So none of this happens by accident, uh, we know that. And it does require ambition. Uh, it requires ambition uh, and a range of policies that support uh, renewables. Uh, for example, in Victoria, we've had you know, the, the biggest reverse auction uh, uh, in, in the country uh, for getting new renewable energy projects built. We've got the Solar Homes Program, $1.3 billion which, is to, which will, by the end of uh, 2030, will have delivered more than 770,000 rebates to Victorians to either take up solar panels on their roof or uh, battery storage in their homes uh, or solar hot water systems. And, um, and we've, that, that, that's just an extraordinary amount of money. We've also putting a lot of money, of course, into upgrading the distribution uh, system and the transmission system. So as a result of all of that, we're decarbonising our economy at the most rapid rate of any of the 
uh, state jurisdictions in the country. Uh, and we know, of course, that uh, sheer urgency of climate change means that we can't rest on that. Uh, we certainly uh, head towards uh, COP in Glasgow. Uh, there's got to be a lot more focus on uh, whether we as a country are finally ready to sign up to net zero. But really, Victoria answered that question five years ago, and many leading jurisdictions answered that question five years ago. Today, we have to answer a different question, and that question is, uh, what do we do between now and 2030? That's the question. Uh, and certainly in Victoria, uh, we will be halving our carbon emissions uh, by 2030. Uh, that is very uh, a big commitment from us. It's an ambitious one, but it's one that we know we can do. And, uh, and that is about making uh, our society fairer. Uh, and taking communities with us. And this is the recipe, if you like, of getting it right. And this is where hope comes in. Hope is absolutely uh, a bottom line for, for us. It has to be if we're going to take communities with us and actually meet the challenge uh, of what we've got to do. Uh, a lot of that will come through electrification. Certainly hydrogen is going to play a role, energy efficiency, uh, but we know that uh, electrification will be the, the single most important feature uh, of uh, the change and the transformation to decarbonise between now and 2030. Um, there's a lot of investments that we've put in, as I said, this is about that democratisation piece. So we've got the biggest energy efficiency uh, package of any state uh, house, for households. Uh, that's uh, $335 million. And that'll mean that we'll be able to um, replace uh, a quarter of a million uh, old heating systems from people's homes. Uh, with high energy efficient uh, electric heating and cooling systems, split cycle systems, reverse cycle split systems. So this will be about swapping out old gas heaters, old low efficiency electric heaters, wood heaters. Uh, and this is about really turbocharging that electrification uh, agenda. And that'll slash people's power bills, absolutely. But it'll also keep them warm in winter and cool in the summer. And this is about people's health too. When we think about climate change and resilience, uh, it's also about keeping people safe and healthy. And it will have a huge impact on people's uh, power bills, doing it well, do, targeting those that are most in need of it. We're also going to be uh, upgrading through energy efficiency, uh, 35,000 uh, solar housing properties. Again, cutting bills while making Victoria fair, fairer. Again, it's that democratisation of the decarbonisation uh, journey. Uh, which really goes squarely to source uh, key evidence, and that is you can decarbonise. Uh, electrification is a key and, uh, way of doing that, and you can actually uh, make significant savings for, for people. So what about the next big challenges and opportunities for rewiring Victoria for 2030 or by 2030? Uh, more Victorian households use gas for space heating, cooking and hot water than anywhere else in Australia. And Victoria accounts for 35% of domestic gas use in the East Coast gas market. And most of our residential gas use, 74%, is for space heating our homes. Now, these facts are historical, given the Bass Strait gas fields and Victoria's cold winters. And that's why we are working on developing a gas substitution roadmap. That's the first, where the, would be the first state in the country to develop that roadmap and it'll position Victoria as the country's leader in gas substitution, showing how we will shift more appliances to electricity, improve energy efficiency, reducing fugitive emissions, and increase the uptake of renewable hydrogen, biomethane, and other sustainable emerging technologies. Now, similar to uh, Saul's findings, our modeling for the roadmap shows that electrification is not just vital, but will do the heavy lifting to halve Victoria's emissions by 2030. And that's why we need to keep building on the household package we released last year, harnessing our incredible solar resource and driving down our household bills. So we're also uh, recently released uh, uh, our ZEV roadmap. Uh, and that's why we, as an initial investment, investing $100 million uh, to reduce uh, emissions in uh, vehicles. Uh, and that includes a combination of subsidies for ZEV purchases, commitment to 50% of new light vehicles being ZEVs, uh, light vehicle sales being ZEVs by 2030, and that all new buses will be zero emissions uh, from 2025. Renewable hydrogen will play a key role uh, in that, 
uh, and we've mapped out that vision in the renewable hydrogen industry development plan, also investing $108 million for clean energy technologies, including renewable hydrogen, uh, to uh, get us uh, on track there. Uh, so the uh, rewiring uh, Australia is very much alive uh, as a rewiring Victoria uh, template, if you like, and uh, we know that this will be a really key uh, strategy for achieving uh, what are significant ambitious uh, emissions reductions, but at the same time ensuring that uh, Victorians, that households, businesses can actually gain the benefits, feel them, touch them, having tangible outcomes for them in their control. Uh, and I really do want to congratulate the Australia Institute for putting together this really important event and very happy to join the, uh, the panel for questions and answers later. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, I can see we've got... Uh, close to 1,100 people uh, on the webinar with us today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. We really appreciate your interest in, you know, what is such a positive story, uh, one that we too rarely get when it comes to climate policy in Australia. So just to quickly recap, as we've just heard, we've got a blueprint, blueprint for rewiring Australia that Saul laid out. We will try and um, send links to that, if not an email around to everyone who has uh, attended today with links to all of the information that we've um, spoken about today. Um, but Saul, I want to come back to you. <clears throat> this is obviously a really big and powerful vision for Australia. And it's really exciting to hear that you're doing uh, a similar, similar work with the Biden administration in the United States. But I wonder if you can just take us through kind of what these next steps look like um, for Australia, if we're going to implement this vision. Uh, like I said, um, Australia is is a, further along than the rest of the world, and we stand to win more, and we stand to win sooner. And and uh, Lily just outlined all of the fantastic programs in Victoria. You could indeed piece together if you took the best of the policies that are in the ACT in New South Wales and Queensland's demand response policies and experiments in microgrids in Western Australia and what's happening in South Australia and, and all of the things that are happening in Victoria, you have about 90% of what you need for a federal policy that looks like a very strong game plan on climate. So I congratulate all of the states for doing their work. We still need a little bit of uh, federal glue to hold it all together with the national, um, uh, the electricity markets need to change the rules so that we, we ensure that the rules of the road of the electricity grid and distribution grids of the future are free and equal for all participants so that each household can stand and benefit from their storage and, and generation assets as much as a utility or a generator can. Um, and then very critically and absolutely um, doubling down on this is only going to work as a transition if it is fair and just. And this just comes from the basic math. If only half of the households can afford to solve climate change, we don't solve climate change. Hmm. And for the top half, they will be able to afford it and afford it quite soon because of all of these, um, the, the prices are dropping and, and we've, we're getting sensible rebate programs in. Um, but the capital cost up front of getting into these things is going to be more difficult for low income houses. And if we wait for everyone to, you know, buy an electric vehicle on the second hand market 15 or 20 years from now, we're going to miss the miss the climate goals that we really need to hit. So I think it's really critical that we have federal finance uh, programs that help the states um, in, in making sure that we bring all families along. And for that reason, and we're doing this in the US, but also doing it in Australia, I think it's really important to understand the very changing nature of what we mean when we say infrastructure, right? In the 20th century, infrastructure was our transmission lines and our snowy projects and our coal mines, and, and they provided wonderful, reliable electricity and energy for the 20th century. But we already know the balance is going to shift. There's going to be a lot more distributed assets. It's going to, you know, Australia could power nearly all of its electri electrification needs on its rooftops of commercial and residential buildings. There's going to be a lot more storage assets. The largest battery in Australia won't be any of the big batteries. It won't be this snowy 2.0. It'll be the collective battery that is all of our electric vehicles connected to the grid. 
And if we start to then understand that our heating systems, you know, my heating system will charge your car one day, your car will you know, cook my meals one day, a battery on my side of my house will help my neighbor sometimes. Um, it really is a, a genuine piece of national infrastructure that we're gonna have in our homes. And so I think we need to come up with the new financing schemes that truly enable that. And quite honestly, even that should feel familiar in the sense that the Australian governments forever have had very proactive policies to help people get into home ownership, um, which is the, you know, the ultimate piece of infrastructure in, in an individual's life. So I'm optimistic that if we get, you know, we, we write the right rules and we prioritize the benefits and the savings going to the households, um, that the, the banks are ready to play and, and come and help with, and um, I think we can do this. And I really do congratulate the states for putting together the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that, you know, no one's done it. I think it's accurate to say no one's done this in one location in the world, the whole picture yet. And so I would actually like to see a race between the states um, to see who can get there first and who can run the biggest at scale pilot in a real community. Um, that would be a tremendous outcome. Um, well, that might take me back uh, to you, Minister D'Ambrosio. You've outlined a, a whole range um, of really exciting projects happening in Victoria to reduce emissions, including that gas substitution roadmap, which sounds really important. Um, but how possible is it for Victoria to electrify everything? And would you consider a pilot version of, of what Saul's talking about here? Well, look, we certainly have uh, a lot of the, the key elements of, of the pilot, as, as Saul uh, described it earlier. Uh, so we're, we're certainly looking for more ways of uh, meeting our uh, very ambitious targets. Uh, in terms of um, the, uh, the, the elements of the electrification uh, work, uh, certainly uh, gas substitution is a critical one. It, it absolutely is. But, you know, making it accessible to people, making it real and tangible is, is critical to this. Uh, and that is why um, we've just got to keep uh, at uh, what are the ways of actually making this accessible to people. So if you have a look at our solar homes program, you know, we're supporting... Uh, uh, more than 770,000 Victorians to either get solar panels or a battery on their roof. Um, and we've, we've, we've tailored it so it's not the top end of, of the, the wage earners or the salary earners. Uh, it's people earning, you know, less than 180,000 a year combined household. When you have a look at the statistics, most people who are taking up uh, the offer are the ones who are earning $100,000 or less. And the reason for that is that you know, they're basically able to get a rebate at virtually no upfront cost. Uh, so from day one, they've got they've got that panel on their roof. Uh, and then when you when you then talk about uh, achieving targets such as uh, halving our emissions by 2030, people can actually understand because they relate it to their own efforts and their own benefits, if you like. So they can see that duality there of an ambition, the need to decarbonise, but when they've done it themselves, it's actually helped save them a lot of money off their bills. So that uh, that effort, uh, we're absolutely determined and we will get to that halving of our emissions by, by 2030, absolutely will. Um, Richie, I might come to you now. We've obviously heard uh, what Victoria, but also a lot of the other states are really um, streets ahead of the federal government when it comes to setting strong and clear targets by 2030. Matt Keane is obviously unavailable to be here today, but he's just announced um, a more ambitious 2030 target for New South Wales and things like renew renewable energy zones. The key ingredient uh, that seems to be missing here is the federal government. We're on the road to Glasgow. What needs to be happening federally um, to get us on track for the type of vision that Saul's outlined? Well, yeah, I guess it starts with that level of ambition. <clears throat> with Glasgow, what, less than a month away now, the entire purpose and political significance of Glasgow is that it is, in a sense, the five-year anniversary of the Paris Agreement. It is the occasion to ratchet up action, and it's focused almost entirely on short term. Um, so that is basically increasing that 2030 target, uh, which is something that, unfortunately, the federal government hasn't done. It has the same 26 to 28% emission reduction target by 2030 from a 2005 baseline. Whereas Victoria has a halving, New South Wales has a halving, um, and some states or territories like the ACT are going even further. So really, 
this all starts with the federal government taking on a strong short-term ambition uh, because that will then require actually electrifying households given they, they form such a large part of our national emissions footprint. Uh, right now, these conversations are in the early stages with the federal government, but there's no reason why they couldn't move forward with a pilot taking an existing brownfield site and actually just electrifying it completely and showing that it can be done. That would be the next step. It would be an easy way to introduce the federal government to this concept um, and, and certainly bring on board their support. So that's something that we'd love to see going forward. Um, so I might come back to you and then we might um, start going to some questions from the audience there. Just a reminder, you can type those questions into the Q&A box there for our panel. Um, this is all a, a really great vision for uh, a lot of clean energy infrastructure. Um, but the other element I guess I just wanted to touch on is fossil fuels. Obviously, it looked like to me around about half of uh, our emissions there in your Super Sankey map are exported um, and don't necessarily count towards Australia's Paris target, for example, but we're nevertheless um, a, a massive exporter of fossil fuels. Um, how much do we have to discuss what's happening with Australia's fossil fuels? And should we be considering, I guess, a halt to new fossil fuel projects in line with the IEA pathway? Um, you know, if we're going to make all of this other stuff happen, does it make any difference if we're still exporting all of those uh, fossil fuels? Um, I think there's a lot of things. There are about eight questions in your question there. About <laughs> Sorry. Fossil fuels. Um, let's just say something that's a bit uncomfortable. We, we celebrate our exports in fossil fuels, but we don't recognise that the profit margin we make on all of the export of all of our coal and all of our natural gas probably doesn't even pay for the, the oil and petrol and diesel we import. So it's, it's, it's not even, you know, if you want to know what the net zero for the Australian economy is, it's digging up all those fossil fuels to just not even break even. So um, it's, I think that's just to say, I think it's less important than we, we've allowed ourselves to think. Um, absolutely we have to eliminate fossil fuel emissions um, by mid-century. I think we should all, the sobering reality is, and you mentioned the IEA report, the IEA report and the IPCC both lean too heavily on very, very heavy amounts of negative emissions by mid-century. In fact, in the two best scenarios of the IPCC AR6 report, that's the most recent one, they're requiring 10 gigatons or more of negative emissions uh, by 2060. That is an equivalent amount of putting carbon dioxide into the earth that we currently have in tons of fossil fuels coming out of the earth. It's, it's very, very, very unlikely. That, re that reality means, and I'm I was watching the chat, there's some people saying, is this urgent enough? Net zero 2050 isn't really urgent enough. We need to look very closely at these um, exports and exported emissions that we have um, to be honest, though, I think, you know, 20, 30 years is a lot longer than people mention. And to bring it back to the conversation about the households, um, people buy cars once every 10 or 15 years. People buy the heating system to their home once every 10 or 15 years. The average water heater lasts about 12 years. So these are decisions that are made every 10 or 12 years. The cadence with which we need to move as a planet now is that at every time we're replacing one of those machines, it needs to be the clean electric equivalent. So we're not going to turn it off tomorrow. We're not going to turn exports off tomorrow. If we do a very good job, it'll take about 20 years. That's one generation of one workforce. So we have more, you know, it just means you might have trained your son to get into the mining industry, but let's give your daughter a job mining. Her, uh, mining uh, the you know the copper and the aluminum the steel that we need to build this other clean infrastructure instead of fossil fuels. So we got to you know stop training the next generation and and taper off at that speed, and that is commensurate with beating a two degree target and actually going close to one and a half. As long as we make sure that every single Australian, the next time they're buying a car or a water heater or a kitchen appliance or the space heater for their house that they have the financing options, they have the, you know, there's enough tradies in their postcode that can actually get the job done. And we've got to make it the easy choice so that Australians can opt in to solving climate change in their daily lives in a way that isn't incapacitating because it has felt incapacitating until now. 
Yeah. Um, the next question I've got is from John Knight, um, and I might address this one to you, uh, Minister D'Ambrosio. He says, by world standards, Australian buildings, even modern ones, are designed to use as much energy as possible. And from a per performance perspective, they're quite woeful. Um, and he wants to know, is that a roadblock um, to implementing, you know, this electrifying everything vision and some of the programs that you've outlined for, for households in Victoria? Well, look, there are many barriers, if you like, but there are also many opportunities that we need to unlock. And part of that, for example, in terms of the built form, is to improve the energy efficiency standards of of new housing stock in particular. We know that, of course, old housing stock is, is a significant problem in this country. I think the average is about two, two and a half stars when we think about it in those terms. Uh, so, I mean, we've committed as a state to uh, introducing a seven-star uh, rating system for the build of new homes. Uh, but uh, similarly, energy efficiency means that we actually start to improve uh, energy efficiency uh, um, investments that we're making means that we're actually starting to improve existing build. So this is a big step that has to be taken uh, in Australia. Uh, but, you know, Victoria has been very loud and proud in terms of pushing for improvements to building standards, absolutely. But we're not going to have a silver bullet uh, uh, that, that, that will answer everything, of course, but certainly there are a number of barriers, there are a number of opportunities. We need to be positive in the way that we approach these and we need to always have an eye to how do we keep costs down, how do we make it easy for people to make the right choices for themselves uh, at the same time that they're making good choices for, for our environment. Uh, and that's where really good cohesive uh, and well-targeted government policies come in to ensure that we don't have those gaps of people falling through the cracks and are left behind either in a locational setting uh, or indeed through sheer uh, inability uh, when it comes to their economic um, uh, ability to be able to, to, to come along for the journey. Um, I noticed we've got more than 1,100 or close to 1,100 people on the line with us today and lots of questions. If you could help me out, if there's great questions in there, um, if you could help upvote them so I can see them because there's a, a ton of questions in there. Um, Lily there talked about um, some of those uh, costs that households face. We've touched a little bit on the equity issues. Saul, I wondered if I could come back to you around uh, home batteries. Ian James has got a question here around home batteries are still way too expensive to be economical for a lot of households and what can be done to bring the costs down. Can you just talk us through some of the economics there and the reason that you're so optimistic that costs will come down? I think um, home batteries are where solar was maybe 10 years ago and um, they're installing on, on Australian household. I'm going to use this to answer two really important questions. Um, and they're installing about $1,200 a kilowatt hour on the side of the house. In my professional life, I purchase the cells and the, and the battery packs at about 100, 120 US dollars per kilowatt hour. So at that price, the cost of storage would be five cents a kilowatt hour, which in combination with our solar would be spectacular. Um, so part of that is, is actually, and Lily brought it up, we need to make sure that the regulatory environment enables the lowest possible costs to be passed on. Right now, we have all sorts of regulatory costs to putting the battery on the side of the house and, and it, it's fire codes and permits and we have to put bollards if you put them inside the garage and that's very much like the problem that america has with solar and why do i say that australians enjoy buying solar at under one dollar a watt americans pay more than three dollars a watt and the difference is certification permitting and inspection australia did a tremendous thing either accidentally or or through sheer genius when it did the solar certification and training program because they till, killed two birds with one stone they built capacity of a workforce that could get the job done, but they also allowed that workforce to be the in inspector and we cleared the permitting hazards. And so the soft costs were incredibly cheap. What's dominating the cost of batteries installations right now is the soft costs, not the underlying cost of the battery. So with a similar stroke of the regulatory pen and a similar certification and training program cleverly designed, and then just the relentless march down of the cost of technology, I think the batteries will yield in the next few years. Um, 
the uh yeah, we'll go over there. That's great. Yeah, no worries. Um, Richie, this next one might be for you because Matt Keane isn't here. Um, Judith Leslie asks uh, or says the New South Wales roadmap to net zero is commendable, but how can the New South Wales government reconcile that with their own planning department's rapid approval of new coal mines and coal mine extensions in New South Wales? We can't speak for Matt Keane or the government, obviously, but what does Australia Institute research show? I know we've done uh, a fair bit of research into that. Yeah, <clears throat> we certainly haven't <clears throat> yet. Yeah, no, I won't try and fill in Matt Keane's big shoes, certainly be a, a poor equivalent. Um, but basically, uh, the 50% emission reduction uh, target set by the New South Wales government is only on the emissions within the um, borders of New South Wales. Uh, and that's part of really the UN Framework Convention accounting on, on climate, which is that you're only responsible for onshore emissions uh, even though, say, New South Wales is one of the, the largest jurisdictions in terms of digging up and exporting thermal coal. Uh, and unfortunately, there's still 20 new coal projects in the works in New South Wales. There's new areas being opened up for new exploration uh, for coal in New South Wales. And if we're all in this together, then this is, this is a, a serious concern. Uh, ultimately, you do have to reconcile these two things, both dealing with your emissions at home uh, but then also dealing with the emissions that you're supplying the world. To some extent, the second part will be answered in terms of the demand for coal, given that the three largest destinations, China, South Korea, and Japan are all going to net zero. Eventually we'll see that demand for thermal coal dry up, but in the meantime, it doesn't seem like the best port of coal to increase exports and certainly the port of Newcastle being the main port, the uh, main port to export coal has taken that on board in actually changing plans for its fourth terminal as well, moving away from coal too. So really, if New South Wales wants to take it that next step, then it should look at revisiting uh, all the permits it is granting out for new coal licenses and new coal mines. That's really what would get to it. And yes, those, those are my chickens in the background, <laughs> the, the joys of working from home. Thanks, Richie. Uh, a lot of love for the chickens in the chat. Uh, people might have e seen Ebony. my... Maybe while you find the next question, I remember I remember the second point I wanted to make about batteries. Sure. Go so ahead. too much fanfare, the Ford F-150 Lightning was announced by Biden only a few months ago. That's the most produced vehicle of all time. More than 50 million of them have been manufactured and more than 25 million are still on the road. That's a, a, a four-wheel drive that's a little bit bigger than uh, the Ford Ranger that's ubiquitous in Australia. It's going to be 40,000 US dollars. What's that? 50, 50 to 60,000 Australian dollars. And it comes with a 100 kilowatt hour battery in it. So it's like a battery at half the price of batteries today in Australia that comes with a free car attached. And it's really to say that we, the electrification of vehicles is, is overwhelmingly important in doing this because it will form such a, an important piece of our uh, storage. And it also will drive the cost of batteries down. Um, the, the, the wag way of thinking about it is you should electrify your vintage car and then your, your wife or partner will allow you to consider that the backup for your battery. Or perhaps you have a jet ski, you should convert it to an electric jet ski. It'll need a 100 kilowatt hour battery and that's more than enough to back up your home. Comes with a free jet ski. <laughs> uh, speaking as someone who finds jet skis quite annoying at the beach, the electrification of jet skis, I think, would be a wonderful revolution to see. It's a win-win-win um, for climate. Here. <laughs> that's right. Um, and for beachgoers, Lily, um, there's a lot of questions in here around electric vehicles and in particular um, the Victorian EV tax. I know that program looks a bit different to when it was first proposed. Could you just take us through um, what Victoria is currently proposing around electric Electric vehicle policy. Right. Well, look, uh, we announced uh, uh, our first um, uh, set of initiatives uh, to increase uh, the uptake of ZEVs, and I've just made mention of that earlier. Some of that it goes towards rebates uh, for the purchase of new uh, ZEVs uh, below a certain value, uh, and including, of course, some uh, additional investments in charging stations. Uh, and other technologies related uh, to buses, etc. Now, in terms of the road user charge, uh, that uh, road user charge, and I know that uh, there will be some on the call here that, uh, sorry, on the meeting here that uh, are not happy about it, but the, the reality is that this is about preparing 
uh, the new revenue streams that are important uh, for the future as we move away from uh, fossil fuel powered uh, vehicles. Uh, and when we strip it all back, uh, we need to understand that uh, with the subsidy, getting that ZEV on the road, you're actually still way ahead in terms of your annual savings uh, by using a ZEV compared to a combustion engine vehicle, including the road user charge. So we're very clear about this. We're, we're already you know, getting good uptake uh, for our rebates. So we don't believe that it's, uh, it's a dampener at all on the enthusiasm that people are, are having uh, to get into the market with that subsidy. Now, the uh, ZEV uh, work uh, is only just started though. This is really important. Myself and uh, the Minister for Transport, Ben Carroll, have, got, have established an expert panel uh, to give us that next wave uh, of proposals uh, and initiatives uh, as recommendations by the end of this year. Uh, which will take us further down the road of uh, improving uh, the uptake uh, and really keep, you know, moving along that decarbonisation of uh, the, uh, the vehicle uh, fleet uh, in the country. That's really, really critical, of course. Uh, and uh, we believe that there'll be some really big offerings coming down that way through those recommendations. And then, of course, we'll give due, due regard to those in terms of announcements post, uh, post that. Um, so coming back to you on electric vehicles, I'm not sure if it was on 7.30 last night or breakfast this morning, you were talking about uh, the ideal policy being, I think, from Norway. Um, I know the Institute's done a bunch of work on that, but could you take people through kind of what the best practice looks like globally for encouraging EV uptake? Um, Nor Norway has fabulous hydro uh resources and they have a very they have a small population and they've had very proactive rebates on electric vehicles um the reality is an electric vehicle whether in norway california or australia is is one or two cents a kilometer to drive and a petrol or diesel is 15 to 20. so the the governments that can think about it as investing in the citizenry and then those savings will be realized and spent elsewhere in the economy that's good policy. So rebating it until we get to cost parity in the car dealership um, is, is good policy given the short timelines we have on climate. And it's only four or five years out before we hit that very important price parity at the dealership. Um, the Anything that encourages the charging network is good. I think if we actually look forward, we, we do a lot of analysis, very detailed analysis on, on how people charge their electric vehicles. Um, you would say that today people treat their electric vehicles like they treat their cell phones. They park them on the beside the bed and they plug them into the wall to charge them for the following day. That won't be the best behavior because the sun's not up um, usually. So that's to say we also need policies that encourage charging networks at the places where we work, where we go to school, where we shop, uh, et cetera. And there's, there's huge opportunities to do the right type of shaping a policy there. Um, but building the market, uh, building the expertise, training, training people to be in the repair networks um, is, is critical. It's all about building capacity, whether that's market capacity or human capacity on maintenance uh, right now. Mm. Richie, um, we've obviously done a, a bunch of work at the Institute. Did you have anything to add to that? Just the one thing that often gets missed is that Australia has no CO2 emission standards for its vehicles, which means that the emissions we're pumping out in our car are pretty much sort of unregulated compared to the majority of the world that have decent standards on the amount of pollution coming out of their tailpipe. Improving that standard, or at least even setting a standard, would go some way to cleaning up Australia's fleet and would also drive more electric vehicle uptake. The other thing that, that Saul mentioned earlier, whilst Australia is the largest exporter of coal and the largest exporter of, of liquefied natural gas, it's completely liquid fuel insecure. Over 90% of our liquid fuels, our petrol, diesel, jet fuel, all come from overseas. By electrifying everything, we go from importing almost all the fuel for our cars and vehicles to actually making it in Australia and most likely making it in regional Australia. So it's just this massive shift in terms of how we operate and the benefits that will accrue if we do that. And that's certainly something that I know the New South Wales government was keen, keen to promote when it rolled out its 50% emission reduction plan last week. Mm. Um, I've got 
probably a lot of people in England uh, wishing they had electric vehicles at the moment as they're all lining up uh, for petrol that's run out or can't be shipped anywhere. Um, the last question I've got is from um, John Denlay, and I might put it to all of the panel. Um, we've got about six minutes until we have to wrap up, so if you could keep it uh, brief. Um, Minister, I might come to you first. It's a question on how we phase out our domestic um, gas network, and I just wonder if you could comment on, um, I know that's a, kind of a, a, a big thing to finish on, but there is a big shift that has to, to, has to happen here. Yeah, absolutely, and it's it's a really pertinent question, and uh, it's it's really good that it's it's the last question because, uh, and that's why I've got this uh, gas substitution roadmap underway because we know that uh, for us to go even further in terms of our ambition to cut uh, uh, our emissions, uh, we need a solution for gas. Uh, that is the next big nut to be cracked, the next big problem to be solved in an Australian context, we've solved um, uh, the power generation. We know, just keep building more renewables with dispatchable capacity, absolutely. We, we've got the solutions for those. Uh, the gas one is the next big challenge and that is something that is squarely within our sites. Uh, we have to reduce our reliance on gas uh, and eventually get to a point where, where the, the reliance is just not there uh, to get to net zero. But the thing is, what do we do with gas between now and 2030? And that's exactly the focus of the roadmap that I've got uh, being developed right now. Uh, it's a big challenge for Victoria, um, but uh, similarly, uh, the, the, there are big opportunities and, uh, and, and the next big challenge for our government is to come up with a plan to decarbonise the gas system. And a lot of that will be down to electrification. Yeah, thank you. Richie, I might come to you next uh, on gas and then we'll finish up with Saul. Yeah, I mean, I think the Minister is spot on. It, it is the next major hurdle, and particularly in Victoria, which, you know, uses up the majority of, of residential gas. Uh, and, and really electrifying everything doesn't mean that we look to replace gas with hydrogen that we pump through our pipelines either. That's just, you know, going from one problem to another. We need to just get off gas altogether. Uh, and so that's why electrifying everything really just nails that in one go. The other thing to mention is that gas is not a transition fuel either. Uh, we're at the stage now and the IPCC sixth assessment report makes clear that we can't afford any sort of false solutions. Um, and so really we need to go straight to where we want to end up. Um, and that is just entirely with renewable energies for our electricity uh, and, uh, and electrifying everything. And that's really a relatively simple narrative to climate change. It's a positive narrative for climate action. And I think it's one that we're very keen to support through Sol's work. So the last question was on gas, but uh, just to give you the final platform, uh, we're about to finish up here. If there's one message you want to leave with everyone, um, take it away. <laughs> well, I, you know, I wrote a book called Electrify. I've been advocating for electrification of everything in multiple continents for multiple years now. And that's for the very real reason that um, we are not winning this fight because people are still using you know, poor arguments to cause delay. The, oh, we'll put hydrogen in the gas network argument. At most, you can put 20% hydrogen in before you run into problems with the metallurgy of the pipes. It's a non-solution. And any investment in that is, a, is a, a dead investment. Biogas. Well, we can and should make biogas and biofuels, but it doesn't scale to meet all of or even nearly all of our fossil fuels. It's maybe enough to do some of our long distance freight, some of our aviation, and that would be a tremendous investment and we should be doing those things. But the things that are easy to electrify, that are more economic to electrify, we should, and a lot of those are in the house. And that's to touch on the other issue, the health issue. Um, in the United States, the protocol at the doctor, if a child represents with a respiratory illness, the first question the doctor is asked to, uh, is told to ask the, the parent is, do you burn natural gas in the house? And if the answer is yes, um, it's very, very, very highly associated with respiratory illness and asthma. That issue we're becoming more aware of. So not only should we be doing this for the economics, not only should we be doing this for the planet, um, we should be doing this for the health of our children. Um, and so, you know, my, my message is stay on target, stay on focus. We need to electrify everything. Um, we need to electrify our vehicles. We need to electrify our kitchens. And I'm just going to own it because it will be up in the culture wars tomorrow. I saw it in the, 
in the chat group, how do I electrify my barbecue? <laughs> um, well, I think we should propose a program with uh, Lily and Victoria for the Subsidised Electric Barbecue Act of 2022, <laughs> where you get a two kilowatt hour induction hot plate. It will cost the government about $500 a home and it will take all of those gas barbecues off off make them off limits those those snags will never taste like fossil fuels again and uh we'll be able to actually you know use that as dispatchable power to the grid um in case of emergency right we 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 have the ideas we have the creativity um we've got to sort of loosen the grip on some things that we hold a little bit too dear and actually realize that there are better solutions and they're right here right now and honestly maybe the the message i'd like to leave you all with most of all is there's no community, there's barely a single house in the whole world that has done this where it wasn't expensive or a pain in the ass. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Sorry. But um, that is to say, I think we are best served if we may a culpa. We don't know how to do all of the little bits yet. We all need to get in it together. We need to get it in it, in it together as communities, as households and as nations. And we need to solve these problems and we need to look create, creatively. If someone says, well, how am I going to do my barbecue? Well, let's provide them with the answer. Someone's really worried about losing their jet ski. Let's electrify the jet ski. There is nothing but good news stories if we apply enough optimism, enough ingenuity uh, and the teamwork that is genuinely, this is not going to be solved without a public private partnership like we've never seen before. The, re the government has to make the regulatory costs go away to keep, the, to keep it in check. Um, and, you know, banks and individuals and households have to come to the table to finance it because it's beyond a single government. So working together, electrifying everything and understanding we don't have all the answers, but we, 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 we will be able to do this together. Excellent. Well, to end on that fabulous note, I think uh, is, is about the right time. So I want to thank everyone, uh, particularly Saul Griffith, Minister Lily D'Ambrosio and Richie Merzian, uh, as well as Ben Oquist from earlier. Uh, we do again send the apologies from Minister Keane that he was unable to join us. I want to thank you all for your amazing questions and I hope you all found that as inspiring as I did. I know climate can often be uh, very depressing. So it's nice to hear about all the solutions that are available right now and that will also save us a bunch of money. <laughs> uh, please join us tomorrow, if you can, for our inaugural Pacific Diplomacy virtual event with the Prime Minister of Samoa. Uh, and obviously next week we'll be launching Climate of the Nation. That's the Australia Institute's uh, survey of community attitudes towards climate change. It's the longest running continuous survey of attitudes towards climate in the country. Uh, that should be a good one. And make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast to follow the money. You can find that on iTunes, wherever you normally listen to podcasts. Um, and don't forget to keep an eye out for Saul's book, which is, uh, I think, going on sale from next week, he said, Saul, uh, congratulations and good luck with that. And thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. We'll hope to see you tomorrow, if not next week. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.